The Power of 40 podcast is an uplifting faith-based podcast that speaks to all that's going on in our world. Our goal is to share inspirational real-life stories and experiences from notable guests around the country on matters that touch us all. The number 40 symbolizes a period of testing, trial, or probation. We all experience trying times in our lives, but it's what comes from these times that make us who we are. As we depict periods of people's lives where 40 has played out, we learn the goodness that comes from perseverance, determination, and belief. Today, I am joined by Coach John Mosley. I am your host, Danica Tramberg. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to just share a few things. A lot of times, you know, uh, we want to talk about basketball, and, the, and but, but to have the opportunity to kind of share, you know, what's really on my heart is, is always welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to dive into this with you today. You took a huge risk accepting a job for just $15,000 a year. What gave you the courage to pursue your dream? Well, I was in between uh, jobs and just finished up at the Division One. And you know what? I, I had done it for about 15, 16 years where I've been an assistant coach and wanted a head coach opportunity. And it was like 15 grand stipend at a community college. And at the time, I hadn't had an opportunity to teach. I, I wasn't on the seniority list mm. to teach any classes. So I said, you know what? I want to be a head coach. Let me go ahead and try it. And I think to add that to the resume, my deal was everyone was saying, telling me like, hey, don't do it. That's like career suicide to go take a job like that and then try to jump back into a division one job and go, you know, at UCLA or USC. They're like, wait, East LA College, community college, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they, they've had success in terms of moving on uh, students, but in terms of wins and losses, they weren't as much. So they were like, uh, I don't know what you're doing. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, but then my wife, uh, she was a teacher. We were like, we could do it for a year. We can kind of afford it. And I just jumped in there and did it. And I think, you know, uh, I think I really found my passion, which was really being able to engage. You know, sometimes you're at the university level and you're so focused on winning because, you know, a lot of times that's what your job depends on is winning and losing. Mm -hmm. um, if you win those games now, guess what? You get those television contracts. You get the television contracts. It's more money for the universities. And um, so the, that's a priority. That's not the only thing um, because a lot of those coaches at the next level, they do what I'm doing. But sometimes that pressure, uh, you know, it kind of shifts your focus to make sure you win first. And sometimes yeah. you forget about the young men. And I was able to just dive into young men's lives and it, and, and I found the passion. And because of that, it, it, it created this environment of caring. And because I care, the, the, you know, the students, they started to flourish. And then it built this thing where we started winning. We had success. And then a lot of other young men wanted to come. And now we're kind of like a state powerhouse, you know, for years. And, you know, even nationally now, and then now we got this docuseries, so everybody wants to come now. So, uh, and then I, and since then, you know, started teaching, uh, everybody asks me, well, this is 15 grand. You, wow, that's mm -hmm. tough. Well, I have a teaching job now, so, so I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, it, it's still stuff, tough. I'm trying to get caught up, but I, I, I just got a teaching job actually just this past year. So I'm a, a faculty member on campus and I'm coaching. So uh, thank God for that. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that as well. Mm -hmm. Clearly your wife and family had to be supportive of you through all of this. What role have they played in this journey? Well, you know what? I think our families, they give us a level of normalcy. So when mm -hmm. I go home, I see people that are kind of normal, you know, uh, right. I, as I go through this, I'm like, you know, people, okay, hey, can we speak to you? Can we get an autograph? I'm like, <laughs> Man, of course, like, you know, and but the family keeps it as a level of normalcy. My wife is is hilarious. We got this joke. She says, uh, she asked, she'll call me and ask me to do something. I say, yeah, go talk to my PR people. And she said, <laughs> she said, boy, don't let me slap you. She said, I'll slap the phone out of your head, you know. So uh, it's just a level of normalcy. And it's just the same when you come home and it's, it's, uh, you, 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 it's just the same and, and the sincerity with our family and the humility we try to go about and the example we try to set for family is, is a, that's super important to me uh, because I think that's where it all starts and any issues we have in our country, I think it stems from our homes and how our homes prepare us to, to step outside the door and react and respond to adversity or respond to praise. 
I think it starts in the home. And, and so I think it's very important for our family to stay close and to be at church together. And I think God called me to be the leader of the family, you know, according to what, what scripture says, I, I need to make sure I keep the home uh, led by God. And, and so I'm, I'm really focused on that. And I'm always looking around as like, okay, Mosley, are you, you got yourself in check and I got to make sure I check myself to remember that's the purpose and the calling is to lead the family first before I even step out and lead at church or anything else. So. So true. And speaking of church, I know you had mentioned you actually consulted with your pastor before agreeing to do the documentary. Um, you thought he might persuade you not to do it, but actually encouraged you. Can you talk a little bit about that conversation and, and how he encouraged you to use your platform to help change lives? Yeah. So initially I got a cold call and they left a message and I'm like, last chance you, you'd like to do, let's talk about it. And I'm like, so I called him back. It was, uh, uh, I think it was executive producer named Lucas. And I'm thinking like, yeah, I heard of it. Okay, sure. I talked to my athletic director and he says, you know, he's a football coach. So previously it was football shows. He says, yeah, yeah you should, you should do it. It'll be good for the school or whatever. And you know, it's funny when, after I did it, he said, yeah, I would have never done it, but, <laughs> um, but then I, I was at, I was in Dallas and it's interesting how this happened in 10, 10 minutes. I went from saying, I'm not doing this, even after my athletic director told me, but it went from 10 minutes that the, the Holy Spirit kind of pressed upon my heart. And sometimes you need to be around the body of Christ and people who share that like-minded so they can speak uh, what God is saying through his word. And they both spoke scripture. A friend of mine, Quincy Brewer, who's San Bernardino Valley College. Uh, community college coach and we always talk about our faith and about basketball we play, play play each other every year we were in Dallas it was a showcase for our young man so I had took Malik Muhammad and he's there and he's playing a showcase he had took one or two of his players to Dallas to play in the showcase and so we're standing on the sidelines watching and I, say, I whisper I say hey I got this opportunity I don't know if I should do it and he said man you got to do it you got to show I was like yeah but what about if I, I might get in trouble for saying something or doing something. And he says, no, man, God has called you to do this. We got to show what we're doing. He said, man, brother, I'm not going to hate. So there's going to be a lot of people that hate because they're going to be jealous because of this and that. And I said, yeah, I'm afraid to be targeted because of jealousy, you know, because mm -hmm. of this platform that I have. He's like, no, man, you got to do it. And then I said, all right, man. And he almost had me. And then I said, man, let me walk outside. So I walk outside and I call my pastor. And I had been meaning to talk to him, but I said, let me call him right now. And I called him and I, and I asked uh, my pastor, I said, hey, there's this opportunity that came up. I just want to let you know, because it's pressing on my heart right now. I think I had a week to decide. And he's, I'm thinking, I'm ready for him to say, yeah, I'm not sure that's a great idea. You know, we just want to make sure we minister and let's be humble about what we do. And God has called us to just go pray with these young men and kind of, you know, what scripture talks about what we do, we want to do behind closed doors and God will uh, reward us openly, you know, uh, but we don't want to do, we don't want to step out there and say, look what I'm doing for people. So that was my mindset. I'm thinking like, I don't want people to see that, how engaged I am, how much I love on people. And, you know, everybody said, was that real? And like, no, that is, I <laughs> love on people. I mean, I was loving, I'm, I was meeting with guys yesterday and I'm loving on people and the, the new guys that I engage with, they're looking like, he's really like this. And I'm thinking like, dude, I'm, it, it, was, it wasn't the camera. Mm -hmm. So to my surprise, he says, no, 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 no. You have to do this because you have to share your life. And I said, well, how about if I do something that I'm not supposed to do? And he said, you won't because that's not your life. You won't do something that you're not supposed to do. You need to share that. And he said, you're predestined and God called you. And if the door is shut over there because they didn't like something you did, God is going to open up another door. And right there, that 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 kind of gave me peace about doing it. And that that little bit of peace that I had, I just said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, once I committed, I, I you know, uh, and so I committed there and that that gave me kind of confirmation that, you know, what am I what am I worried about, you know, to have peace? But uh, I did jump back into some level of worry, you know, right before we started. I said, what am I doing? What am I doing? Uh, I had two moments where I would literally, you know, when God calls you to do something that's on that level, you know, I was really shaking. I was like, one day I was just laying in the bed, kind of shaking, like, Lord, what did you have? Right when we started filming, why did you call me to do, why did you want me to do this? Like, 
I'm just happy with my life. Just, you know, just I go to work, I teach classes, coach the team. We win some games, guys transfer, go to my daughter's softball game, son, you know. And then after the show was finished and then they said, okay, it's about to come out in about a month. And then I'm just literally, again, I just literally was sweating bullets like Lord. And then, you know, he had to speak to speak to my heart again and just give me a level of peace and be like, I'm in complete control of this. And he was in complete control of it in, in, in terms of how it was edited. It wasn't too much. I was over the top sometimes. You know, I went in there and I, I preached sometimes and I had scripture and almost every time that I spoke in an inspirational fashion on, on the show, I had scripture and I was, you know, when we were in the mountains, I had my phone in my hand and I was going through, I went through a, a mini sermon and, you know, it was cut down a little bit, which was good because it could have been, it could have turned people off as well, you know? So right. I think God had his hand on the whole thing where it was, it was, it was orchestrated so that it was a level of ministry. It was a level of inspiration, encouragement. It was some authenticity. It was everything. So I, I think God had his hand on it. And those people were creative. They're awesome. The camera people, all that stuff, their talents were you. So you don't tell, I don't take away anything from their talent, but God used their talent to put this together. Yeah. And I, I watched the series as well. And I watched you teach spin classes, deliver sermons, uh, and be a mentor and coach for your team. I almost got exhausted just watching all the emotional and physical demand um, you really went through and getting pulled in so many directions. How did you keep motivated and keep a positive attitude through it all? I I really don't know. I just feel like uh, <clears throat> part of it, you know, I got this competitive spirit. I want to kind of have success and win at everything. That's one part. But ultimately, just asking God for the energy to be just have just to, you know, I feel like I have to be an example uh, in all you do. You got to glorify God. So. I feel like I have to glorify him in everything I do. If I'm teaching a spin class, he has to be glorified with my efforts. So no one can say, you know, that he's not giving his full effort. I might be the, not be the, the greatest spin teacher. I may not be the greatest coach, but you're going to know that I care. Uh, the purpose is for you to get in shape in this spin class. You're going to know that I care about you getting in shape. And, and, and I'm no different in this spin class that I am with my, with, with the players, the basketball players. So it's not just the, the basketball team. But when I'm teaching health class, when I'm teaching spin class, you know, I'm like engaging more with my health. Uh, well, right now I got a sports nutrition class and a sports ethics class. I'm more engaged, you know, more engaged in that than I am with my players because they still won't let us in the gym. It's crazy. We were in L.A. But uh, I'm the same way and the same thing with my family and my kids. I'm engaged. You know, I was running around. I went to my son's basketball game last night. and We had a conversation about, you know, basketball and. So it's, it's, it's just the way that I, I, I think I try to be to engage and really care about others and maybe invest in others. And I, I, I think that's where the energy comes from. I don't think about if I'm tired or not. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you'll see me sit on the couch and I'm tired, but I don't think about am I tired enough. I just think that each and every individual deserves my, my, the highest uh, level of energy. And I, there are some coaches that say uh, head coaches can't have bad days as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's obviously so clear to how important faith is. Can you talk about the role faith plays for you in your life, both on and off the court? Well, I didn't think I was going to be a, a basketball coach. And I think my mentor who just recently passed away in January, 2020, he, he said, Hey, I had one class to finish when I came from, uh, I, I came from Brazil and Australia. And he says, uh, won't you come finish this class so you can get your degree. And so I'm there sitting on the bench um, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do to glorify God? I started a program called safe through hoops in the inner city where I was, uh, doing free clinics. And then I would minister, but he said, come and <clears throat> get your degree. And as I'm doing that, and he said, sit on the bench and help me coach this year while I do it. And so I'm like, okay, I'll do it just to finish up my degree. And what I found is I saw how you, you can minister through basketball and, uh, I think when you have that true conviction, when you truly are called, I mean, you start to have that level of compassion that Christ had. And I, th I think that's ultimately, you know, where the gospel lies is, is there's, there's this good news that, that there's salvation for all that are lost. And so I see people that are lost and then my heart uh, becomes convicted to have compassion on others and really care 
about others. It's not me. So I'm not saying I have compassion. It's just the, the Christ that's in me. So Christ is in me. He has compassion for others. So if it was me, I'd probably just, man, let me get out of here. I don't have time for this. But I think if we we say, if we're saved, that the Holy Spirit that's in us, it has a level of compassion because that's Christ that's in us. Okay. So yeah. I think the Holy Spirit, um, the, the you know, and I'm saved by grace. I was the worst of worst, you know, like Paul. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, it just drives me to have compassion for others. And sometimes I get caught up in winning games. You know, all of us, we get caught up in winning games, right? We get caught up in our careers. We get caught up in making money. So I'm no different. You know, sometimes I drift off. You know how we drift? We kind of drift away. I get, I drift off and want to make money. I want to mm-hmm. win basketball games. I'm competitive. I get and all those, those uh, human things come up in me. But then at the heart of it, when that's really pressing and it's sitting <clears throat> right there in front of you, God convicts you. If the Holy Spirit is in you, he convicts you to have compassion for that person that's, that's, that's struggling and that has the issues. And I think that's what it is. And, you know, I, I try to share the message with others like, man, everybody's praising me. You're, you're the goat. You're a great coach or whatever. Yeah. It's, the compa- it's, it's the compassion and the conviction of the Holy Spirit from, from salvation that's doing that. It's not me because I keep telling people I'm not perfect. I'm probably going to make a mistake tomorrow. When I get off this call, I'll, I'll make a mistake. But it's the, it's, the, it's the compassion, the Holy Spirit that drives uh, the compassion. Yeah, and I really could see the compassion play out and how deeply you care for your players, both on and off the court. How challenging is it for you on a personal level to be so committed to the men that you coach? Oh, it's very challenging. So, every you know, you can celebrate me if you want, but I'm telling you, I'm I'm (laughs) always at at the at a point where I'm just like, you know what, he can go for real. And, and then you do need support. You need, mm-hmm. you know, you know, my wife, I come home and I get frustrated and then I'll see her smile. Sometimes it bothers me because she's always smiling. I'm like, like, stop <laughs> smiling. I want to be mad right now. I want to, I want to frown and I want, I want to pout. And she's there, you know, you got support like that. And then you have your coaching staff, you know, you got great coaching staff that they say, Hey coach, uh, don't worry about it, coach. I'll go talk to him. So you do need a support system as well. So I'm not saying I'm perfect. And, you know, everybody's like, oh, you're so caring. You're so loving. You're so understanding and patient. I'm up. The human comes out of me as well. I get impatient. Uh, and But I knew when I'm, you know, when I have the support system that they help me with this cause of having compassion on others as well. So it, it, I'm not telling anybody, it, I don't challenge anybody to try to be, be like me, unless this is your calling. You know, everybody else, everybody has their gifts, but, uh, you know, I can't take all the credit. It, you know, it's the Holy Spirit that, that presses on me. Okay. You need to have a little bit more patience for Joe Hampton or this person or that person and understand what they're going through. Um, and really have a relationship with them that gives you the patience when you understand what's going on in their lives. So, so yeah, that's, uh, I can't take all the credit. It's a support system. It's the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I, I do, it, it, it's really tough, but, but God has, has really convicted me and given me the discernment to know when, uh, to press hard, when to say, to, to love them hard and when to love them soft. So it's, I, I gotta say it's the discernment. I think I'm a better discerner than I am a coach. So, yeah. And during last chance, you, it was evident that you're dealing with some pretty big personalities, tempers, and many challenging situations off the court. And you really never gave up on a player who was giving you the most challenges. And later in the series, he thanked you for that. Were there moments where you lost faith in him or your ability to remain supportive of that young man? Well, you know what? I I have to show them that they can't give up on themselves. So first, I can't give up on them. So if I don't give up on them, then it's less likely of them giving up on themselves. And a lot of times that's what would happen is they'll give up on themselves. And when they give up on themselves slightly, then in some cases, people give up on them. Like, okay, they don't really want it. Uh, I don't have time for this. And that's fine if you don't have time for it. But for me, I feel like I have to uh, show that I'm not going to give up on them. And then when they see that, they see a level of hope. Because it's been, they've lost hope. The, the problem is a lot of those guys have lost hope because people have given up on them. And 
not giving up on them at the beginning, but give it up on them when they didn't get anything out of it. So a lot of times somebody feels like they're not going to get something out of it. So they give up on them when someone doesn't respond the right way. Of course, if he's worth millions of dollars, you're not going to give up on him and you're going to see him through and you're going to say, see, I helped him make these millions and now give me my 10%, you know? Uh, but when, when there's nothing to earn or to be gained from helping someone and not giving up on them, that kind of builds a level of trust in a player. And they feel like, okay, I can trust him because he has nothing to gain and he's not giving up on me. Um, and, and, and I just know that there's diamonds in all of them. And so that response that you see on the outside, you know, that's, that's to me, I, I grew up with those responses. I walked out the door and it was, that's just kind of how we were responding because of our culture and environment. And we just have to learn how to not stereotype that. And, and because I see a diamond, I say basketball reveals because I can see who they are. I can see they're really unselfish players. They really, mm -hmm. really want to be winners. They really want to be successful by the way they play. That's kind of like they're where they can open up is on the basketball court, but then they may respond to adversity the wrong way. And we write them off and we stereotype them and not really know they're not responding that way because they don't want to be successful in basketball. So why would not continue to help them? They're responding because they, they have never learned how to respond to criticism or never learn how to respond to adversity the proper way. It doesn't mean that they can't perform in life. It's just, they haven't learned how to respond to adversity. Um, and, and that's what I kind of help them through because there's a diamond in there. And, and for all of us, there's a diamond in just about everybody. And for us, you know, people may, they may, you know, who've invested in our lives, they can see our diamond a little bit. They saw it shining through. They say, oh yeah, there's a diamond. I'll take her. I'll take, I'll take John and help him because I can see the potential. But mm -hmm. the, the ones who have all the corrosion around them and all the baggage, because they have been abused, they have been abandoned, they have been let down and disappointed those that have all of that corrosion now they have this protective fiber around them because they don't want to get hurt anymore uh they've been written off those are the ones that you know i say you know i'm gonna spend a little time even if i kind of can't see the diamond let me chip away because i know there's good in everybody and 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 i know that everybody needs a chance um and so that's just me and, and i'm not you know danica i'm not asking everybody to do this you know like mm -hmm. This is just what I do. So everybody who listens to this or who's watching the show, so I got to be more like that. Well, you know what? Your calling may be to make a billion dollars and donate a million. You know, mm -hmm. that may be your calling. That's your gift is to be, you know, a ph philanthropist or humanitarian, just give or just or set up foundation, whatever it is. You don't have to be in the trench. I'm in the trenches. So if you don't get it, you don't get it. This is what. But if you say you want to do this and you want to be actively engaged, then you have to have patience and you have to have compassion. So that's what I do. Um, you, you know, you, you're, you're hosting this podcast, you know, that's, if you call to bring ministries on and, and, and to, and to have a, uh, you know, a, a foundation, uh, a place where they can hear different messages, then that in itself, that can help people. It's not, just everybody do what I'm doing. So um, I don't want to make people feel burdened that they got to do exactly how I do. You know, this is just what mm -hmm. I do. And I'm just explaining how, why, how, and why I can do it. Yeah, it's so true. And sports, I mean, everyone has their own avenue of life that they can um, be lights for other people. And I think sports at times can be a metaphor for life. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how good coaching can't, can't just change games, but can change the, the players' lives? Yeah, well, I think <clears throat> from an athletic standpoint, the young men, th there's this carrot. So they got a carrot. And if the coach uses the carrot properly. So the carrot that I have is they want to get a basketball sh scholarship. They want to pass these classes and get their education. And then one of the biggest carrots is they all want to play. They all – so if we can use this carrot properly and kind of dangle it in front of them – and help shape their lives and say, if you want this carrot, then here are the things that you need to do. And how can we convince them to do these things to get this carrot? And then eventually, when we convince them how to shape their lives, how to build structure and discipline and all those things in their lives to get this carrot, the carrot is really not the issue. We're just holding it to make them think they're chasing the carrot. The issue is developing the structure, 
you kind of manipulate them into developing discipline. You manipulate them into getting their education. You manipulate them into becoming better ball players and learning discipline on the court and how to function well as a basketball player. And you do all those things. And as a coach, if we can do all that and get them to do that, then eventually the carrot that they're chasing uh, is not even a carrot. They, they, what they really want is what you've taught them to do. They really want discipline. They really want their education. Um, the carrot is kind of like a, a fake journey that they want. You know, they want to get to the NBA. They want that. You know, they want this. They want that. But once the things that you you kind of prepare them and force them to do to get the carrot, once they have that, they realize that's the real value. The value is the discipline that I learned. The value is the education that I got. The value is, you know, learn, learning how to get myself in shape. And then eventually the carrot is kind of like something that, man, I was really chasing that, but I really learned. And so I think if we can, as coaches, we can, you know, we be strategic of how we make those guys chase the carrot. Uh, and every coach has has their has a way of, of how they do it. They all have a way of how they do it. And, and I think that's the beauty of coaching is to be able to make them uh, chase that carrot, whether it's winning games and you can, you make them think, Hey, we're going for this championship, but really, you know, they built it up in the story. Like Mosley's trying to win a state championship. And really it was trying to build these different mini foundations. Mm -hmm. Everybody had these goals in life and trying to build these foundations in their lives to get to this goal. And as you do that, you develop some, some, you know, you, you develop these attributes, you know, as you, as you move on. And I think that's what basketball does. We, or sports, in general <clears throat> you say it builds character no i think it reveals and it has a level of build where it builds this these different foundations uh in life as well so so i think that's the journey of a coach is to to kind of have this carrot and make them uh you know make them develop all the things that they really need to develop but you make them think they're chasing this carrot but they're really chasing the inner self they're really developing the inner self well, you've truly made such an impact on these young men's lives. I imagine you've also been getting a massive number of inquiries from, you know, major four-year universities. Do you see yourself staying at East Los Angeles College for years to come? Well, what I tell others is I, I, if, if I can't do what I'm doing here, uh, like I, I mentioned, I'm fortunate enough to have started, you know, uh, a full-time faculty position. So faculty position. So it's a decent pay. And I feel like, okay, now at some point, me and my wife can be comfortable and she, she's not going to have to work or anything like that. Uh, so I'm comfortable in that regard. So I'm able to spend time with my family and help my kids and with their different things. And so that's important to me. And if I, if I go somewhere where I can't do that and really have an impression on young men's life to the point where I'm not so worried about winning games to keep my job, um, then I'm okay with that. Yeah, I can move on and see if there's a bigger platform where I can share the same message, you know, and I'm not going to be over the top with it. I'm not going to take a Bible and beat it over people's head. But what I want to do is just be, have compassion for others. And then maybe that may lead some people towards Christ, you know, um, not, I don't have to blurt out. I don't have to say Jesus, 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 Jesus all day long, you know, uh, but just have compassion and help people first. If we could do that, I mean, that's what that's what he did. That's what the, the, that's what he did. Um, because now that that gives you an ear. Once you start to help people, then there's there's an ear there to hear uh, the true message that's coming behind the compassion. So if I can do that, then yeah. But if not, I'm not chasing any job. So uh, I think someone would have to say, yeah, we really want you, and we think you'll be a good fit. And I would have to do research and see that it makes sense. But I'm not going to jump into uh, you know, with agents and, you know, and all that, there's a world that you have to jump into if you want to, if you, if you want to be a part of, you have to be a part of firms, hiring firms, they have hiring firms for coaches and different things like that. And I'm, I just don't have the, I, I don't have the, I, you know, I'm authentic. I'm not going to jump into that world unless that world truly feels like that I have a space there. But if you call, if you're asking me to go jump into that world and chase, chase it down, I'm not going to do that. That's you definitely lead by example, and I think that shows through in everything you do. How has your life changed since Netflix started streaming your show? Well, here's the problem I, I didn't have social media, I had Twitter, but I never sent out a tweet up until three weeks ago when the show started <laughs> almost four weeks ago, whenever. 
I never had Instagram and I had, I didn't have social media. So social media now I feel the pressure to like what people post or I'm like, dude, this is like, for me, it's like, it's an added component to my day, really trying to respond to all emails. So everybody out there who's listening, who's sent a message or something, I'm really trying to read through it. My wife is like, dude, get off that thing. You can't. And I said, I know because my kids had social media and all that. And I used to tell people, man, get off. I used to tease everybody like, man, you're wasting your life sitting there looking at that Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Every I said, man, get off that stuff. And now I find myself, I'm sitting here scrolling, trying to respond to messages. And uh, so that part has changed. Uh, not really much else other than having a platform to reach out and and kind of share some key moments in the story of the, the the docuseries, which which I completely expected people who wanted me to reach out and just share uh, my thoughts on the show and and what came out of the show. I, I was prepared for that. So, yeah, I did not realize that the message was that loud and clear and that it was a, uh, a pure, uh, you know, it was it was uh, an introduction of the gospel. You know, I didn't realize that. So from that standpoint, I'm I'm grateful. And, uh, you know, it's kind of puts me at a humble state that God would use me. I'm kind of humbled by the fact that God would use me to to share that message. I just thought I was going to be just this hard nosed coach that helped people, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think people heard uh, the introduction. You know, I didn't get a chance to. Well, it didn't come out in terms of scripture, but it was at least a seed planted uh, that there was a level of sincere faith um there so i i can't say that we completely shared uh a message uh the scripture but there was a sincerity and authenticity of faith there uh i believe on and showing our family and how you know the family dynamic so i think that's changed as well and so i, I really have to examine myself and and kind of make sure that i'm staying along that that line and not chase any you know you got people you need to write a book you need to do this <laughs> like you know what i i don't know if i have time to step away from the clear message to do that but if mm -hmm. if, if if we want to share our faith then 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 fine through 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 the books and through anything so this is why I, you know, this right here is exciting because i get a chance to what's truly on my heart to share yeah it, it's so nice to hear too from you know just the authenticity that you share and the passion and, and enthusiasm that you share with everything that you're working towards right now and i'm, and, not, I'm not perfect i'm not perfect <laughs> I, I want to clear that everybody's oh he's such a great dude i am not perfect but we as believers we got to be clear what it put it like this if i just put it out there now i'm held accountable to what i say too so mm -hmm. it's not that it's not that i'm i'm perfect and then I'm gonna do everything I say. But if I keep saying it, then I, I'm a, then I'm like, man, I said that I'm gonna live this out, so I have to live it out. Otherwise, I might it's hypocrisy. So mm -hmm. I have to say it. I keep affirming it and saying it, so I make sure I live it out. So I'm holding myself accountable too. <laughs> yes, it's so important. And as we close out today and reflect on the power of 40 in our lives, maybe trials we're going through or have overcome, we understand that in life we'll continue to experience the good and bad life throws our way. 40 also seems to be significant in regards to time. Jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. The great flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. The Jewish people wandered the desert for 40 years John, if you had just 40 minutes to impact the world, where would you start and what would you say? Well, I will go to, I think our country has a lot of influence. So I will go to the White House and say, we got to start with the families. We have a lot of uh, interest groups and social social movements. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think that's the, that's where we need to be investing. I think we need to be investing in, building up families and the right message in the families. Uh, I know a lot of people will say they don't have trust in the church. Uh, I think we need to build a level of trust in our churches and, and hold, you know, our churches be held accountable to sharing the, the, the word of God, the true word of God and, and not get tied up in the interest groups and, 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 you know, uh, you know, for the sake of money, uh, they lose the message, you know, that's one of my mantras as well. The, don't lose the message for the sake of money. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can share the, the right message through our churches and through our families, I think it starts there. 
Uh, I think the, the, you know, in my opinion, if I'm any way controversial about anything, I'll say uh, breaking down the family structure is not the, 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 the answer. I think building that up, the problem is our family structure is, is breaking down and that's, that's where, our, where it starts. Um, and not to say that the family structure uh, doesn't have its, its flaws when it is a family structure. That's it. To me, that's individual sin. That's not the family structure. That's not the, the church. There is sin in the church. And I think that's what's driving away uh, those from the church is because there's sin in the church. But let's remember, it's not about the church. It's not about the pastor. It's not about the people. Why don't you take a look at God and see who he is? Don't look at the pastor because the pastor is going to fail us. Mm -hmm. uh, our leaders are going to fail us. Uh, we got to look at God and don't look at the leaders. Look God, because our leaders are, are human and, our, and we got some great leaders around the world, but our leaders are going to fail us and we need to look towards God. I, so I think that the last thing I said, I think that's probably, that's probably where I'm going, you know, yeah. our, everything will fail us, but God, God won't. And if we truly learn who God is, that's the one who won't fail us. All these other movements, all these, you know, everything else, everything else will, or I wouldn't say when, I would say if, when those things will fail us. Even our family, mm -hmm. our parents, our, our pastors, uh, everybody, humans will fail us, but God will never fail us if you truly know who he is and you truly accept him. Yes, I love that. And John, it was seriously such a pleasure talking to you today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And if you haven't checked out the Netflix series, Last Chance You Basketball yet, please check it out. And for more information on the Power 40 podcast, visit powerofhumans.com. Also stream the podcast on your preferred streaming service.